All right, guys, how's it going? By now, you've almost certainly heard that there are new AMD graphics cards incoming, not Vega, the 500 series. And if you're paying close attention, you pretty much know that they are rebrands or not far from it. The Polaris rebrand should not come as a surprise to you. I did predict this would happen back in October last year. This is what I said. What AMD is likely to do is reban and rebrand the RX 480 as the RX 580 next year. I expect this to be maybe a 175 watt card with clock speeds of around 1400 plus megahertz. It's basically the same silicon on a naturally improving process. Based on rumours from the likes of video cards and everywhere else, that would appear to be what we're getting. I think it's safe to say that most enthusiasts take a rather dim view of rebranding. And so I decided to take a look at it a little bit more closely. What's the reasons for it? What's the history of it? Some interesting stuff in this one, hopefully. Now I had some of this stored away in my memory, but I'm not 100% sure on it. But most of you probably imagined that Nvidia would have been the first company to dream up the heinous crime of rebranding their graphics cards. But it seems in fact it was actually ATI. Now ATI have been gone for a while obviously, but they were no angels. And in fact, they were a pretty good counter to Nvidia and certainly gave as good as they got. And it does appear that they were responsible for the first ever rebrand in the graphics market. Now in all honesty, there's different types of rebrands. You've got the straight up rebrand where you take the exact same graphics card and simply stick a new sticker on it. That is a straight up rebrand, but even then some rebrands are worse than others. So let's take a look at this one and see exactly what it was. Over at Anantech again, way back in 2001, what happened was ATI had decided to launch their new 7000 series and 8000 series graphics cards. ATI were moving their branding. Instead of the Radeon 100, they'd now decided to move over to 1000s, 7000s and 8000s. And here we can see the four cards ranging from 8500 to the 7000. And we can also see that there are four different cores. But the one that's most interesting was RV100, the same core of the Radeon VE. Now, if we scroll down, we can see that the Radeon 700 is essentially the Radeon VE without its dual display capabilities. But more importantly than that, the chip does not have hardware T and L support. Now, T and L is transform and lighting, which Nvidia brought to the graphics card market with their famous GeForce 256. Hardware transform and lighting is one of the biggest changes in graphics. And looking at the four cards, only three of them have support and the RV100 did not. This is a problem because they're rebranding old cards, but they don't all have the same feature level. And what's worse, they are all named as a 7000 series. So this is just deceptive, basically. The average person had no idea about hardware T and L or any of that stuff. But most people would still believe that three cards of the same name or the same series would be capable of the same sort of thing. Maybe the lowest number would be that little bit slower. But that wasn't the case here. And Anand explained this really well. It's really irritating to game developers because the card would not run hardware, transform and lighting. And it's therefore not really viable. It's far too slow. Had the Radeon 7000 ended up a very popular GPU, it would have held back gaming because developers obviously need to target those graphics cards that people are using. So this isn't just consumer unfriendly stuff. It goes further than that and it harms progression. So it does appear that ATI were to blame for starting all of this way back in October 2001. Now we all know what Nvidia is like. They really do take things to another level. If ATI are capable of this, then Nvidia are capable of way, way worse. And surprise, surprise. A few months later in February 2002, the Nvidia GeForce 4, NV17 and NV25. Now, Nvidia's GeForce 4 series is a very famous series for one very good reason and for one very bad reason. Now, most of you will know about the good reason, which was their GeForce 4 titanium lineup, GeForce 4 TIs with the flagship 4600 and also the very popular 4400 and 4200. These are some of history's best graphics cards and back then were highly sought after and very famous. But sadly, at the same time, Nvidia also decided to rebrand their GeForce 2 series as the GeForce 4 MX. This wasn't a straight rebrand, but you're talking basically the same chip with one or two features added on. So not only did Nvidia skip one generation with this rebrand, they actually skipped two generations, straight from GeForce 2 to GeForce 4, and it really did make it worse the fact that they had combined the MX series of cards with the TIs. What this did was make people believe that the MXs were much better than what they were, when in actual fact they were utterly dreadful graphics cards. 
But like what we saw with the radio in 7000, this is more than simply a deceptive rebrand which harms consumers. This one also harmed progress. Like Anon said, unfortunately, Nvidia stuck with the name GeForce 4MX, which is even more misleading to those that aren't well informed, as it gives the impression that the card at least has a minimal set of features that the GeForce 3 had which it doesn't. Specifically, the GeForce 4MX features no direct X8 pixel shaders and only limited support for vertex shaders. But as I said, it did also include parts of the real GeForce 4, including the AccuView anti-aliasing engine and also NVIEW support. But the real problem was the lack of DX8 compliance. And as Anand explained, well over 80% of all the graphics cards sold are priced under $200, and this is where the MXs were. So 80% plus of the market would not have DX8 support, which simply meant developers would be less inclined to support it. Looking through this article is actually really interesting. When Anand was talking about how ATI realized the weakness of Nvidia's product line, and so they positioned the 128MB Radeon 8500 LE at a very similar price point as the GeForce 4 MX460. The Radeon 8500LE clearly offers better support for the future and would be the better option of the two. Does this sound familiar to anyone? So this effectively makes the GeForce 4 MX460 pointless as it's priced only $20 less. So no problems there. With the superior forward-looking architecture, the Radeon 8500LE would surely take over the market. But those of you following my channel already know that that is never going to be the case. And despite harsh criticism by gaming enthusiasts, the GeForce 4 MX was a market success, which rapidly replaced the GeForce 2 MX as the best-selling GPU. And as we can see here, the dominant market position of GeForce 3 and 4 meant that not many games targeted superior DX 8.1 feature level of the R200. The 8500 also came with support for Trueform, which was an early implementation of Tessellation. And stuff like this really does show why rebrands are not only bad for the consumer, they're bad for progression. DX8, Tessellation, you have to wonder where we would be now had these been implemented at an earlier stage. But the GeForce 4MX sold by the barrel load, and the 440MX was my first ever graphics card. Now, back then, I had simply no real clue about what I was buying. I knew the GeForce 4 was a great series of cards, and I ended up buying an MX because that was in my price range. And it came with a free copy of Morrowind, which was a game that I really wanted. It didn't run that game particularly well, sadly, but I continued to buy Nvidia cards anyway. I had a 5700, I had a 6600 GT, and then finally I decided to try out ATI, around about 2007 when I bought the X1950 Pro. But after that I went back to Nvidia due to their amazing 8800 GT. Now this is probably the most famous graphics card ever and most of you watching this probably owned one. It was of course based on the massive G80 GPU, and ATI, who at this time had been absorbed into AMD, simply could not compete with it. R600 was a disaster, and RV670 was very, very small. It simply couldn't compete on performance. I talked about this period in my GPU War Is Over video, which if you haven't seen it, is probably my best video. But the point here was, Nvidia had found themselves in what looked like an unassailable lead. And it was around about now that I started to pay real attention to the graphics card market, and also tech forums. And this is when I started to realise the massive amount of mindshare that Nvidia had. The story is well known to tech enthusiasts, but probably not to the average consumer. What Nvidia did with the 8800 series was pretty ridiculous. They got an awful lot of mileage out of this one, including the $830 8800 Ultra. That was back in 2007, by the way. And this graphics card was universally panned as being way overpriced for what you got. But when you've got a really good graphics card and your competitor is kind of struggling, why bother changing it? And that's how Nvidia saw it as well. Again, this wasn't a complete rebrand, but the 8800 series swiftly turned to the 9800 series. It was basically a die shrink from 90 nanometers down to 65 nanometers. That step was actually taken before they had rebranded to the 9800s. You can see over at Wiki here, we've got the 8800 GTX and the 8800 Ultra on 90 nanometers, but you also got the 8800 GTS 512 on 65 nanometers and of course the 8800 GT on 65 nanometers. And again over at Wiki we can see the 9800 GT, and as we can see in the final column, some 65 nanometer cards are rebranded 8800 GT cards. But what Nvidia did then was almost unthinkable. There were rumours going around that Nvidia would rebrand it again, and AMD took the unprecedented step of pointing this out in one of their marketing slides for their new HD 4700 series. 
a slide labelled innovation versus rebranding. And what we can see here is, in 2007, AMD had introduced a new architecture, the world's first 55 nanometer GPU, and the world's first DX10.1, which I will talk about later. At this time, Nvidia had the faster 8800 GT. AMD, who were still using the ATI branding at this time, then launched their successful 4800 series, another new architecture, the world's first teraflop card, and the world's first GDDR5 memory. And as just discussed, Nvidia basically rebranded the 8800 to the 9800, the old card with a new sticker. And then in 2009, the world's first 40 nanometers, third generation DirectX 10.1, and second generation GDDR5. And AMD had presumed that the 9800 GT would once again be rebadged to the GTS 240. Same card, new sticker. Now that's not quite what happened, but that was mostly due to AMD's success. Over at Anantech, they explain it. In their NVIDIA GeForce GTS 250, a rebadged 9800 GTX Plus. In the beginning, there was a GeForce 8800 GT, and we were happy. Then they got the faster version, the 8800 GTS 512MB. It was more expensive, but we were still happy. But then it got complicated. The original 8800 GT, well, it became the 9800 GT. Then they overclocked the 8800 GTS and it turned into the 9800 GTX. This made sense, but only if you ignored the whole this was the 8800 GT to begin with thing. And by this stage, it was just getting kind of stupid. Once you got to the GTS 250, you're basically talking about a rebrand of a rebrand. So why did Nvidia do it? Basically speaking, Nvidia had launched the GT200, better known as the GTX 290. 285, 280 and 260 cards but again this was a massive GPU they couldn't sell it cheaply and as you saw in the GPU War Is Over video, AMD's much smaller RV770 was far more manufacturable and much cheaper so Nvidia had to rely on its last generation GPU the G92B, same architecture and a die shrink of the G80 they basically had to rely on that in order to compete. Effectively, their fastest G80 graphics card, rebranded and die shrunk, was just about able to compete with AMD's slowest RV770 on performance. The problem was, of course, it couldn't match the AMD card on feature level, for example, DX10 versus DX10.1 on the AMD cards. And Intec weren't pulling punches back in those days. It was a different time, and guys like Derek Wilson and Anand simply did not take any crap from the likes of Nvidia. Rather than continue to ship products with old names to vendors and customers, Nvidia slaps a new name on an old GPU and hopes to at least provide the appearance of being just as agile and competitive as AMD despite clearly being caught off guard this generation. Which is pretty much what happened with their GeForce 4 MX. Nvidia's case is they want to maintain a consistent nomenclature so that the general public knows what the product positioning actually is. But Derek Wilson is not buying that one. Nvidia's take on this is flawed in that it treats customers like idiots and underlines the fundamental issue we have. Saying they need a name change to maintain current naming is essentially admitting that the only reason the name needs to be changed is to mislead uninformed people. And at its heart, that is exactly what rebranding is. Effectively, what this was, Nvidia simply could not compete with AMD on a hardware level. At this point in time, AMD were innovating year after year after year. Nvidia were rebranding year after year after year. And they had got the name. Nvidia had got that name as a rebranding graphics company. But things got worse because one company's got DX10.1, the other company doesn't have it. And it came to a head with the Ubisoft controversy over Assassin's Creed DX10.1, where it was discovered that the HD3870 X2 gained major performance in the game with anti-aliasing enabled, gains of up to 20%. But soon afterward, Ubisoft said that they were removing DX10.1 support. Now Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed was of course part of Nvidia's The Way It's Meant To Be Played program. So this was a massive controversy at the time. As always, there's gonna be links in the description below. You can read through this stuff and make up your own mind. But once again, it shows the biggest issue that we have always had in the gaming industry. In most cases, the superior technology goes unused. And the reason for that? You already know what the reason for that is. Through all of this period where AMD innovated and Nvidia rebranded, you already know who sold the vast majority of graphics cards back then. And AMD's innovation continued because after the 4700 series became the Cypress series, the 5800s, 5870, possibly one of AMD's most famous graphics cards with iFinity, they then created another new architecture the year after with Bart's and Cayman 
while NVIDIA rebranded Fermi from the 400 to the 500 series. I mean, sure, they fixed most of Fermi's problems, but that was still a rebrand until finally, just before 2012, AMD launched the last big architecture change with GCN. At the same time, Nvidia launched Kepler, and we know what happened. Simply put, AMD were out of money by this stage. They were cancelling projects all over the place. They simply couldn't afford to continue. Creating a new architecture every year, the cost is running into hundreds of millions now, and that kind of money AMD would never recoup. So rather than creating new architectures, they basically rebranded. GCN got rebranded over and over. In particular was the Pitcairn graphics card, which started off as a 7870 and a 7850. They had a really sneaky rebrand in fact, as they moved away from the HD series names onto the R9, R7 and R5 series. So the 7870 became the 270X, but the year after that, they basically rebranded it again to the R7370, which I believe is actually a slower card as well. This is the kind of rebranding that is really no good, and AMD's entire lineup became a mess. But here we are now in 2017, and AMD rebrands the 480 and the 470 into the 580 and the 570, and it's basically a direct rebrand. Slightly faster clock speeds and that's pretty much it. Looking at all of this, the history of it, both companies, or all three companies if we include ATI at the start, are guilty of conning the consumer and holding back progression. And it's just going to get worse as time goes on because Nvidia no longer need to try and AMD no longer has the money to try. And really, this is what it comes down to. The problem was never the rebranding. The problem was the consumer ignorance. Like back in 2002, when I bought the GeForce 4 MX, I had no idea what I was doing, but that purchase contributed to the lack of progression. All of Nvidia's rebrands simply contributed to the lack of progression because these cards sold by the tens of millions and there are still millions of them in circulation today. All of AMD's innovation was for nothing. They simply didn't sell enough cards. And now the only possible way that these cards can exist is if they are stretched out over two or maybe even three years and rebranded as new. I mean, make no mistake about it. This is purely about money. Nvidia is sitting on billions of dollars, but they've got nothing new coming. Cards like the RX 580 and the RX 570 probably breaking even for AMD. The GTX 1060 is currently outselling the RX 480 by almost five to one. It simply wouldn't matter how fast or how slow that card is, it would still massively outsell the AMD competition. So now AMD's taking the chance to rebrand the 480 into the 580 and have another go at pointing out that, yeah, we are faster than the GTX 1060 and maybe even sell a few more cards. I don't like rebrands, but the simple fact here is the type of person that falls for a rebrand, this is the type of person contributing to the demise of the gaming industry. The only people that care about rebrands are the enthusiasts. But what are we going to do? Cry and moan about AMD rebranding graphics cards again? What's the alternative? Nvidia? Is that somehow better? Innovation requires two things competition and money. We have no competition in the graphics market and AMD has no money and that's why the graphics market is the way it is. So the last thing you might consider is this. While none of us like rebrands, the alternative is the RX 480 did not exist either. AMD already didn't release a high-end graphics card. As a company, they would be fully justified in not even releasing mid-range and below graphics cards because they are not making money on these. You want to think long and hard about what that would mean. And I'll be honest with you, some days I wish that on PC gamers because I wonder how bad it needs to get before people wake up. Now make no mistake about this, this is not an Nvidia problem, this is a consumer problem. It's us or the other people not watching this video. They are the problem here, not Nvidia. Nvidia is doing everything Nvidia should do as a company. I will be reviewing the RX 580 and the RX 570 and you can probably tell from this video that I'm not blown away with the performance and neither will you be. But in the end, I've got graphics cards to review. I'm not reviewing the politics. I'm not reviewing the rebranding. It would be the same if Nvidia sent me a Titan X. I need to review the card based on its merits, not based on Nvidia's behaviour as a corporation. But I hope you learned something in this video. I've kind of rambled on again, but when you know the history of all this, and when you understand that I basically followed this and watched this happening, over the past 10 years, I have watched all of this unfolding before me, and the longer it goes on, the longer I realise that something major has to change. And sadly, I feel that that change has already been made. So on that rather sad, sorry note, I will bid you a happy Easter. As usual, during the holidays, I'm working on videos, but with me not being religious, it would be hypocritical of me to celebrate it anyway. We'll catch you later, guys.